lives. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight. I asked a few of the seniors what they would like me to talk about, and Miss Sydney Hogue said, I wrote this down, so I got I quoted her correctly, you should talk about how super awesome we are. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting idea. After about three hours of YouTube videos, that's exactly what I intend to talk about. How super awesome are you? A few years ago at Wesley High School in Massachusetts, a teacher named David McCullough had the privilege that I have tonight of addressing the graduating students at commencement. Now you may remember what he said because he made the national news and his speech is still on YouTube, which is kind of where I came across it. All because in that speech he said something that was pretty shocking. He told a group of smiling, happy graduates and their families that although they had been told all their lives that they were special, he told them none of you is special. He correctly pointed out that 3.2 million seniors graduate every year. There are 37,000 high schools in the U.S. That means there are 37,000 high school valedictorians. And he pointed out that even if you have been told that you are one in a million with a population on our planet of 7 billion, that means you are one in 7,000. There are 7,000 people just like you. Now, Mr. McCullough was not trying to be insulting, nor was he trying to hurt anybody's feelings. He was just throwing a little cold dose of realism on the graduates before they entered the big, bad, post-high school world. He was a brave man to tell a group of school children of any age that they are not the special little center of the universe. That kind of borders almost on heresy. Well, get ready for Heresy 2.0, because I'm going to tell you something similar. Now, I disagree with Ms. McCall on one point, and this may be splitting hairs, but I think he blurred two ideas together, that of being unique and that of being special. You are all unique. You are not one in a million. You are one in a Googleplex. If you know anything about numbers, that's like a lot. And check with Mr. French. There are 37,000 high schools in the U.S., but there's only one Iberia R5. There are 37,000 valedictorians, but there's only one Sean Keith. And there are 3.2 million high school graduates this year, but there's only one of you. Your DNA is uniquely yours. Your fingerprints are uniquely yours. The people sitting behind you who have raised and cherished you are unique. Your teachers are unique. Some like Mr. Hammock are very unique. This town is unique, this school is unique, and everything you have ever learned or done in your life is uniquely yours. You are absolutely unique, but so of course is everybody else in this gym, this state, this country, this universe, and all other alternate dimensions. So it doesn't mean we're all the same. No, that's the really cool thing about being unique. By definition, it means you cannot be the same. All right? But being unique is not the same as being special. Grants of saying are unique but they are not special. Snowflakes are unique, but they too are not special. And you, very unique young people, you are not special. We, your teachers and your coaches, have told you that. We've been lying. You are not special. We just didn't want to hurt your feelings when you were playing t-ball. You are not special. Not yet. Because although you were born unique, you're going to have to make yourself special. Special, being special, is an acquired status which no one is just granted automatically by birth. What you do will determine if you gain this status. And the choices you make in the future will determine if you gain this status. Because we define ourselves, we create ourselves through our choices. And when we speak about special, I should be clear that we're talking about special in a positive way, not Joseph Stalin, Jeffrey Dahmer, or the TV executives who canceled the original Star Trek series kind of special. That's not special, that's just evil. <laughs> So what does it mean to be special? It's very simple. When you depart this planet, as we all shall someday, being special means that you made a difference if you were once here. For a long time or a short time, to many, a few, or even one, it made a difference that you once walked this earth. That's all. It sounds simple, and it sounds easy. It sounds like the bar for being special was set pretty low. But think about how many you know that can't even accomplish this. They squander their precious time. They don't use their unique talents. And when they shuffle off into the next life, they have created nothing. They have changed nothing. Why? Well, 
they made the wrong choices. You are what you choose to be. And some people make the wrong choices. They want to make the right choices, but they find it hard to change out of patterns of repeating bad choices. As much as they want to change, don't change their lives. You know why it's so hard to stop smoking or to lose weight? Because you keep repeating the same things. You do the same things. You live the same way, in the same place. You repeat the same patterns. If there are things you've ever always wanted to do with your life, if there are things that you always wanted to stop doing, this right now is going to be one of the best chances you are ever going to have. Because ready or not, your life has just been changed for you. This phase of your life is over. The next phase starts tomorrow. It doesn't matter what you were or were not in high school. It doesn't matter if you were the prom queen or the basketball star. It doesn't matter if you were the coolest of the cool kids. It doesn't matter if you were the kid that spent most of his or her time in Mrs. Luttrell's office. Tomorrow, the clock is reset to zero. The slate is now clean. And what is written on it in the future is now up to you. You make the choice. Are you going to try to bask in high, past high school glories? It won't do you much good. Try impressing the people in the unemployment line with your past achievements. Tell the guy in front of you that you had the best layup shot in Nigeria. He'll tell you that he had the best layup shot in Crocker. Or on the other hand, are you going to drag your past failures around with you like an anchor? It won't do you much harm. Because no one will deny you a job because you spent a lot of time in detention. Employers are interested in what you're going to do for them in the future. Now sure, colleges and recruiters will look at your grades, and those things matter to them, and they shouldn't matter to you. But as you sit here in your ceremonial graduation gowns, there is precious little you can do about those grades now. They are what they are. So what are you going to do now? Are you going to be held back by what you did before, or are you going to forge ahead? Now you may have noticed in all of this, and all my urging for you to be special by making a difference, I never once said what kind of difference you should make. That's a very simple reason for it. I don't know. With my old withered imagination, I can't conceive of the kind of differences that you can think of creating with your fresh young minds. A world of choices is open to you. I know what kind of difference I chose to make. What you choose, that's up to you. Make a choice and be prepared to live with the consequences of your choice. And we, your families, your friends, your teachers, and your coaches all pray that you will make the right ones. But we all know, down deep in our hearts, that once in a while you make a bad one. I can't speak for anyone else, but as a young man, I made a few decisions that were real stinkers. And I had to live with the consequences of those actions. I had to face up to losing them. And you will someday have to face up to losing them. All your lives, your elders have tried to make you winners, but sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with losing them. And I'm not talking about losing your car keys, the TV remote, your cell phone, a game, or even the trim physique you once had. I'm not even talking about a serious loss, like a loved one or a close friend. I'm talking about going all out and trying something and losing. And I mean, I don't mean half try. I mean, you give it your absolute best shot, and it's still not enough. And sooner or later, we all have to face up to losing, to be a loser. But we never, ever have to face up, or want to face up, to being a failure. Because you're only a failure when you lose and you quit. When you give up on yourself. When you've made one bad decision, you've done something stupid. Maybe even you had serious consequence as a result of that. But instead of fighting back, Instead of changing and learning and making the right choice in the future, you let that one bad choice, that one loss, dominate your life. And you quit. You give up on yourself. Well, now you're not a loser. And you're not special. You're a failure. But if you don't quit, you can never be a failure. And I have a historical story to illustrate. One of my favorites, and I've told this story before at every graduation I've spoken at. You all knew I was sticking to history stories sooner or later. There was a man who seemed destined to fail at everything. He was a soldier who was forced to resign because of his drinking. In civilian life, he failed at business after business. He took up farming, and he failed at that. He eventually wound up working for his brother, who gave him a job out of charity to keep him and his family from starving. But when war broke out, this man went back in the army, rose to command, and became an incredible success. And of course, I'm talking about General Ulysses S. Grant. 
I always had a particular affection for Grant. I felt we had some things in common. Service in the Army, beards, and we both married women from St. Louis named Julia. Of course, he was a Lieutenant General, I was only a Major. I never had a drinking problem, and his wife Julia was nice. And I'm sure she didn't shriek at him like a rabid harpy because he occasionally forgot to put his socks in the hamper a couple of dozen times. But Grant, with or without socks, was a great general in battle. He never quit. Even when faced with setback after setback, he would always regroup and try something new. He never quit trying. When promoted to overall command of the Union Army, this never quit attitude allowed him to defeat a general who was clearly his superior. But Robert E. Lee had never met anybody like Grant before. The best story that illustrates his character has to do with the Battle of Shiloh during the Civil War. Caught by surprise by a brilliant Confederate attack, the Union Army under Grant was swept from the battlefield, forced back against a river. Only the cover of darkness saved the North from total destruction. The Confederates fully expected to resume their attack in the morning and either force Grant into surrender or force him into the river. Late that night, Grant was riding his horse along the riverbank. It looked bad for the North. He was surveying the situation when he encountered his subordinate commander and good friend, General Sherman, who was never one to mince words. Sherman looked at Grant and summed up the situation. Well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day. Grant kind of grunted, replied, yeah, lick him tomorrow, though. That night, Union reinforcements came up in riverboats. The next morning, it was the Union Army that swept the field. I've always remembered that story. And I have said to myself on more than one occasion, well, I've had the devil's own day. Lick him tomorrow, though. If you don't quit, you can't be a failure. You can lick him tomorrow, or the day after that, or the day after that. But don't give up on yourself. You can't be special if you quit. You can't be super awesome. You have support. You have family. You have friends. You have faith. Use your unique talents. Use this unique opportunity of graduation, commencement, the new beginning. This has been presented to you. Change your life. Make yourself special. Make yourself super awesome. It's a big world, a big country, a big state. Go see it. Go live in it. Move out. Expand your horizons. Get a job in the city. Join the army. Go away to college. Travel. Hit the road. Scram! Don't limit your dreams. The entire world of opportunity is open to you. Go dance on the stars. Iberia and Brumley are small towns. Don't limit your horizons to the intersections of Highway 17 and 42. Leave. But don't ever leave in your heart. This unique place is an essential part of who you are. Small, rural communities like Iberia are little bastions of common sense in a world that seems to make less and less sense every day. Growing up together, as you saw in that video, all right, in such a small, close-knit school and community has bonded you together in ways that I never saw when I went to school growing up in a city. There were 450 kids in my graduating class. I knew a third of them. And in many ways, you act a lot more like family, like brothers and sisters, than like classmates. That feeling is very special. Don't lose it. To a large part of the U.S., most of those living on the coast, this area is mainly flyover country. We're the three hours between trays up and locked and wheels down. To those of us who live here, we know that this is the heartland of America. The ways and lives and values of this place are what has made our country strong for over 200 years. Coming from here helps make you strong. This is the kind of spirit that we want you to take with you wherever you go. I urge you to go out and see the world. And the reason is simple. This place is not perfect. But the twist is that until you get out into the wider world, you really can't appreciate how good this place is. Even if you physically leave here, don't leave here in your hearts. And when the time comes and you want to come back, we'll be here. It's been said you can never go home again. That's baloney. Of course you can go home again. That's what home is. The place you can always go back to. It'll be the foundation for you to make the right choices for the future. And when you've made those right choices, when you have properly utilized your unique talents, when you have bounced back from setbacks, when you have expanded your horizons, when you have made a difference, when you have made yourself special, then own it. There are people 
some very smart people, that will tell you that nobody can really do anything on their own. That the things you make aren't really yours, that you didn't make that. These people may be smart, but they are also completely and utterly wrong. Just as unique as you are unique, your creations, your achievements, great or small, are uniquely yours. And there is one last tool that can help you on this journey to specialhood. Yeah, I just created that word. It's mine. I own it. I made that. And this tool is very powerful. It's humor. It does seem to be one of your strong points, class of 2013. And while you seniors may be excellent practitioners of humor, as I witnessed in the uh, speech by the salutatorian valedictorian, you may not realize the real value of humor. Because there are going to be times when you mess up, you fall down, you just look ridiculous. You rip your pants, you sit in something purple, you say something stupid, you may look foolish, you may be embarrassed, don't get mad, shrug it off, see the humor, and laugh. A wise woman I know once said, was when she wasn't yelling at me to put my socks in the hamper, she once said something profound. No one on their deathbeds gazes up to heaven and says, Dear Lord God, I really wish I had spent more time being ticked off. Life is too short to go around snarling when you can go around laughing. Humor is one of the most potent weapons we have to combat the everyday stresses of life. And I know that you, class of 2013, you think you're stressed now. You think your parents and your teachers have stressed you out. Ooh, ooh, ooh cry me a river. You don't know what stress is, but you're about to find out. Because all new sources of stress are about to enter your lives. Bosses, college professors, drill sergeants. And then there, of course, are the strangers. The ones we encounter who seem to be in a permanent state of rage. We usually run into them when lines waiting for food, or at an airport, or in traffic on a highway, where they aggressively careen down the road, gesturing wildly. And you know the gesture I mean. And they are mad at you. Because you, they think you cut them off, or your car occupies the exact same physical space on the road that they wish to occupy. And they can't understand why you don't get out of the way. And they invite you to participate in their miserable, rage-filled lives and get just filled with rage and misery as they are. Don't do it. Keep a sense of humor. Smile. It's better for you, and it makes them even madder. So to recap. We're proud. You are unique. You are not special. Go and make yourself special. You know, make yourself super awesome. Make the right choices. Don't quit on yourself when you make a wrong one. Lick them tomorrow. Leave. Don't leave. Smile. We've tried to do our best for you, your parents, your teachers, and your coaches. We have raised you. We have nurtured you. We've even polished you up a little bit. We love you. I mean, I don't love you. You don't want that. But there are people here who do love you. But not me. But I feel I can speak for my fellow teachers when I say that it has been our pleasure and our privilege to be your teachers these past 13 years at Iberia R5. And it has been an honor for me to speak to you, class of 2013, on this, the date of your graduation and the commencement of the next phase of your life and to have the chance to give you one last lecture. God bless, good luck, and goodbye.